not only do they, uh, it's not just the millennials, but there's a revalorization of time. And what we mean by that is uh, because of the kind of the way that we're technologically connected now, I remember when you would submit papers to journals and you would actually do it in hard copy and send it off in an envelope. It sounds prehistoric. <laughs> That's what you did. You send it off and then you would wait another month and a letter would come back. And you type it on the time. And you type right. it yeah. and you send it back. And if you think about that, now you send it and the guy I get stuff from students. I emailed you and I look at the time. I, yeah, you emailed me forty five minutes ago. I'm not fucking answering you, honestly. But that sense of like, now we have the sense of like, we do more in less time. The old joke, I always tell people, is like, when they introduced computers, they, uh, when it was becoming mass computers, one of the arguments was, well, we'll all have more free time. <laughs> that was, that, the computers were going to solve the time crunch. Because you could do all your work with these computers, and then you'd have so much time, you'd be lolling around, I don't know, uh, drinking daiquiris around your swimming pool or something. But that was the promise. And actually it's been quite the opposite. Because we have to do more in less time. Right? Mm -hmm. But your turnover time for almost any communication now is almost instantaneous. Someone emails you and then they're like waiting for the response. And you can find yourself caught up in that. You find yourself when you're disconnected. So I've been on the road now for about a couple of months now travelling. And I did actually, and I'm not all that connected, but I did feel that disconnect as if a couple of days would pass before I could get to an email. And so now we're wired. But, but what it means is that each unit of time is actually more valuable for us because we can do more in any individual unit of time than we ever could before. Mm. Uh, so we're doing more in less time. And then there's the revalorization of time. And I put this up as the Danish study. Because if anyone, everyone in America, seems, all the econometricians, always want to suck up to Danes. And the reason for that is the Danes have the best data source you could imagine. They have a big data, they have like a national data source. That you can tell, they, you can tell when people moved, where they worked, where they moved to, how long their journey to work is, how long the, everyone in the household. They have the most incredible data sets. And so everyone wants to do these Danish studies, or they want to work with Danes, right? Because who can speak Danish, right? Is one thing. Um, even the Dutch, it's not so much a language, it's more of a throat disease, so it's very really deaf. Is that what you say? <laughs> <laughs> even the Dutch say, the Dutch say that. I have a that, somebody's Scottish. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> there's a guy who kind of pronounced it Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Van Gogh, no? I don't understand what you're saying. Such a strong accent. So I put this Danish study in, because, uh, just a word, because what they have is they showed you from this incredibly detailed survey work that people given the choice at the higher income they will move closer to their to their work they will minimize their journey to work and this is in Denmark which is not a huge big suburban and 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 transport public transport is cheap so even with all of that unlike say if you were in metropolitan you know, US somewhere where you know, longer journeys to work. So the Danish study is almost like a classic, almost a scientific study of a place where, you know, the cost of travel is quite small. Mm -hmm. And what it relates to is the valuation of time. Just an increasing valuation of time. And single person and non-child households do value time more high. It seems counterintuitive, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, p parents are going at kids' time. Oh, you have to get the kid up, you know, whatever, you have to do all of that. Singles, it's all about your time, right? Or like, you like, get up, you, you're not like waiting to change the diapers, you know, the kids in the middle, whatever. So what, the interesting thing is that more and more, you have more and more single person or non-child households. And the urban economy is valuing time collectively more than ever before, which reinforces that in the central city. Could you also turn that argument around? Because of my friends that didn't want to have children, always the argument was time, that they wouldn't have time for all these things. Sure. So maybe yeah. people that fell the time don't want to get children. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So it could go both Sure, ways. yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. So that the causal thing could go. And actually, richer households have a higher valuation of time. And that's kind of obvious in the sense they can do more maybe or whatever. 
And so what you think of the combined combination <coughs> of factors now. You're getting richer people, single people, kind of valuing time, wanting closer access to central city employment and services. Um, so some of the consequences are obviously gentrification and displacement. No, no. I'm, I think I'm going to wrap, go. You've got five minutes. Okay, all right, okay. Um, the other one in the US is the suburbanization of poverty. The obverse of this moving into the central city is that uh, the housing market is actually changing in the US, that there's more people, more poor people living in the suburbs. So that suburban dream of the 1950s, you made it, <coughs> when you made it, it was embodied in the move to the suburbs, it's actually being displaced. I would say something new urban ecologies, new urban politics, and the boom in Boston, the land market. So you have reuse of the abandoned, and yes, you have like a re... So this is Singapore, this is Chinatown, it's like named after you guys, right? So, um, and actually, they, they couldn't wait to knock all of this stuff down in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And now they're painting it and they're making it Chinatown with quotation marks and, and kind of re-valorizing kind of re something that had been dumped, you know, they couldn't wait to knock over. This one's a good one for gentrification. This is Washington, D.C., and I took this photograph because these are row houses. And this is a kind of classic kind of displacement. So you have like two stories, there's no building. The only building code, it can be higher than the Capitol building, which is still pretty high. So most of Washington is actually lower height than you get New York. But so what you do is you buy a house from a kind of elderly black couple, and then you just like pop it up like that. And so you can see this, you can see this, this is like classic gentrification kind of going on in these, this was traditionally um, African American area in Northeast Washington, and you can see the transformation in this one here where they've added that. Um, and I put this up all that is solid because I was involved in an interesting experience. I was going around taking photographs of the city, which is in Washington, D.C., and we were taking photographs of the Northern Bowl. And a young kid, young kid to me, he was like 18, 19, he said, Could you take a photograph of that? And I said, Yes. He said, I spent my first year there. And when you have a 19-year-old having nostalgia for the urban landscape, you know you're in a period of change, right? Different for old guys like me and Ray, you know, like, oh, yeah, whatever. This guy was 19 years of age, and he's feeling nostalgic, which is the yeah. same sense that Marshall Behrman, so Marshall Behrman's great book, All That Is Solid, is basically the phrase from Marx and Engels, All That Is Solid Melts the Air. What Behrman did was actually, if you read the book carefully, He's actually basing that experience on the destruction of the Lower East Side in New York as he's growing up, watching Robert Moses constructing the motorway. Now, personally, but that destruction, so that made him think of that phrase, all the solid. And so you're getting this melts into air. Uh, and so you're getting this, like, war zone almost in, in, in much of central urban America. Uh, this is uh, Baltimore. Lux 432 luxury apartment, and this is along the waterfront, and there was nothing there before. So the previous one is clearly kind of gentrification displacement. This one is non-residential being constructed, and there was nothing here before. So people always, like, graduate students are always like, oh, man, the gentrification thing, and then you have to work through, like, it's, well, to what extent does it meet with the classic? And we just drop that and just kind of go straight to the new build. And this is uh, 14th Street in, in Washington, D.C. And then I take these photographs because that's the city I live in. You could have done this anywhere in, in major U.S. cities. Um, and this is townhomes being constructed, right? Um, Authenticity. Pardon? Authenticity. Authenticity, like townhomes, they're, they're constructed like townhomes, but they were built two years ago, right? Um, and so it's suburbanization of poverty. So the percentage of America's poor living in Cities, 1970s, drops down, and from about 1990, remember when I said the moving back into the cities, I see there's more poor people living in the American suburbs than the American cities. Uh, and this is the rapid rise of suburban poverty. Uh, the, the millions, this is just absolute figures, 16.4. So you can see 1990 starts to pick up. And so what's happening is new households, poor households, they're, having, they're paying the cost of cheaper housing but living further out. Uh, and so that 
actually it's reinforced during the housing collapse. One of the biggest areas for housing collapse it wasn't just the inner city, actually it wasn't all that relative, it was actually areas like this, the ring of um, suburbs built between 1950 and 1970, older, kind of built post-war, uh, filled by kind of, you know, uh, recently middle class. And so you, that's, there's this incredible inner ring around most urban America where poverty is concentrated. And it has a particular political consequence because they have no political platform. You know, the poor are concentrated in the big cities. Big city mayors have some political weight. But if you're spread out in a lot of suburban municipalities, poverty is simply dispersed, it disappears. So what's interesting is, is actually it doesn't appear, so the notion of poverty doesn't appear in the political discourse in the US. And I think partly because they're kind of missing, they become, in the urban ecologies is just that transformation of cities, um, a sort of new urban environmentalism, um, and a sort of the bike lane bike lanes and the dog parks and the whole kind of thing because you're getting more of these millennials moving back in. Mobile phone lanes in some places. Is there? Is that, you can, is that a joke? Or no, is no, that no, true? No, okay, I'll have to get that Beijing photograph, right? Mobile phone lanes. And one of the other things is once, you're, now you're, once the central cities become a place where the richer are moving back in, they're still worried about the kind of poor. And so what you're getting is urban surveillance. And this is more global. This is actually, um, you know, tell me where this is? Four languages. Indonesian, <coughs> Sri Lanka. All right, you feel the joke. <laughs> this is um, Singapore, because it's uh, Chinese, isn't it? Is it Chinese in there? Mm. Um, Tamil, mm. uh, Malay, mm. and English. Police camera in operation. 